This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I agree. I agree. Well, I agree with that with journaling. So I, I can't write. Um, I can't write stand up. Like I can't write a bit. But if I journal, I'll find something that I go just write. The kind of writing where your the pens moving faster than your brain, and they're kind of like doing it together. The thing I liked about Ernest Hemingway. This is so stupid. I'm a little dyslexic, and so I'm not a good reader. And so he wrote very simply. And it wasn't until after I read a bunch of Ernest Hemingway, I was working at Barnes and Noble, and this person said, "Don't you love his titles?" And I was like, "Yeah, Sun Also Rises." And they're like, "Yeah, but no, the Sun Also Rises." And I was like, "Yeah, Sun Also Rises." And they're like, "No, the no, the Sun Also Rises." And I went, yeah. "Oh." Oh yeah, that is fucking badass. Yeah, and then I, I'm like always late to the party with anything. And then that night we were all doing coke, and uh, it was like five in the morning, and we ended up on the roof of my apartment in Greenwich Village. And this, the, the, like, I'm a sunset guy. I grew up in Florida, mm -hmm. but sunrises in New York are electric blue, like electric blue. And I was like, the sun also rises. <laughs> Right drunk, edit sober. Right drunk, edit sober. Yeah, but he was good at like at like a small amount of words to to get a point across. I'm the exact fucking opposite. I think so. <laughs> it's the best one I have. <laughs> it goes downhill from there. So for you, editing is destroying the original. The first time genius. I tell it, the first time I tell it, it's perfect. It's perfect. It, it just, it works. And then I go, great. And then I take it and I try to fix it and make it better and jazzier. I just joke and razzle dazzle about my daughters and I driving past a, a deaf child sign. And uh, I just told it on stage. It just happened. And Louis was in the audience. He goes, I love that joke. I said, really? He goes, yeah. And I just told it and I went, done. Louis C.K. says he likes a joke. Mm -hmm. It's fucking, it's in the special. Mm-hmm. And I tried to fucking razzle dazzle that joke into like a fifteen minute bit. It got to the point where it was so obno it was so bad that I I I told him I, I did a podcast with him. I said, "What did you like about that joke?" Because I can't get it to work anymore. Mm -hmm. Because it was just simple. It was simple that your daughter didn't know how they figure out where deaf kids lived. I went, "That's it." He was like, "Yeah." I was like, "Nothing about gun control." And he was like, "Huh?" I was like, "Oh fuck, man." I really fucked that joke up, and then I had to I had to go back to the beginning of it. But that first time, that's when that's when the joke comes out purest for me, and then it's always chasing back to get that get that first telling. Some jokes are different, like the machine. Obviously, it was a much longer story, and like and like uh, escape room for this one. The longer stories take a little work, but the the simple ones, like like the deaf child in pajamas, and those first times are perfect. I think it's a. I think, I don't know. I really wish I, I don't know. I think it's a good story. I think it's a good story. I think everyone has something similar that happened in their life where they had a crazy night mm -hmm. and that no one believed mm -hmm. and they told their friends and their fr and, and, or they experienced that with a friend like that. And, and, and I think, I think that's gotta be it. I really don't know. I think there's a part of, I think there's a part of the like our community of com of comedy fans that were that early death squad that it was fun to watch someone take something from the podcast and turn it into a bit on stage. Uh, yeah. I think there was a lot of that, but I think people identify with a wild, crazy night that got out of control that they've probably had too. I, I think, I don't fucking know. Do you think Putin knows who you are because of that story? I hope so. I fucking hope so. I hope so. But there's there's a part of me that, that you got to understand is like, I'm not, I say stuff like that. I'm sure there's someone who hears that and they go, who is this fucking narcissist? And you're like, no, that's not it. I'm just telling you the truth. Like, I understand what I'm supposed to say. Well, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. That's hard to say, but I don't fucking give a shit about that guy. Mm -hmm. I'm not that guy. I'm telling you everything that comes out of my mouth. The second it comes out, I'm going to be hundred percent honest. I don't know any other way to live. I kind of hope so. <laughs> that would be fucking cool. And I look, I know he's a bad, I guess he's a bad dude. I don't follow politics, ton, but it'd be cool if like 
one day someone's like, uh, he's he's on his computer and some guy goes, Stoleta. And he's like, eh, Yamashina? And he's like, Da? Kunyesta, And he's like, and he shows it to him. And, yeah. and then he's like, fucking this guy, huh? It's... Especially the people Interesting you've people. met. Like that's, I mean, that's the thing where I go, like, it's gotten really crazy. The internet's really insane and Netflix is really insane. And the reach of like people that like, this is really simple, but like, I'm a big fan of the show Drink Champs. I didn't think mm-hmm. in a million years Nori would ever know who I was. And then he offered me to come to his podcast. And then when I got there, he told me he was a fan of mine. And I went, like, I remember moving to New York, listening to you. And Capone, like, I'm sitting there going, wow. Man. Like, and, and then and the phone calls I've gotten since the movie came out and uh, since Razzle Dazzle came out have been really insane when you realize a, as much as I know about people, and I, I like, I, there's people I'm fans of that don't know who I am, or that, 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 like, that are like, they're like some uh, pitcher in fucking Florida that I follow the kids. I like, I think it's fun to watch him pitch. There was a softball player in uh, Tempe. That she do catching drills, and I was really into softball with my daughter, and we watched her catching girls. There's a girl, D Glazer, who me and my daughters would watch her dance videos, and then I hit her up. She's like, "You know who I am?" And you're like, "Oh yeah, that's the way the world works." Uh. Boris Yeltsin would have been a good one. <laughs> he would have been a fucking good one. I mean, like, I, I I go, Hitler was a pussy. Like he he drank wine with a with a cut with a spoonful of sugar in it. Yeah. You know Never who drank went, what? It's Churchill. That's my hold on. That's my guy. Yeah. You know that's my guy, right? No, I don't know. That's your guy. So he uh he did champagne. No, well, let me well, okay. you don't have to tell me All a right. thing about All Winston right. Churchill. <laughs> he I found out about his daily routine. <laughs> yeah. So his daily routine was a big breakfast, cigar, coffee, eggs over eggs sunny side up, toast, bacon, sausage, tomato, beans, yeah. uh, fruit, orange juice, soft scotch cigar in bed and he'd sit there for three hours Mm -hmm. and he'd hold morning breakfast and that's they'd come in and he'd run through his day and then he'd get in the bathtub for fucking an hour and drink champagne and then he'd go to lunch and have some goose or whatever the fuck they ate back then Mm -hmm. with more champagne and then and then and then i mean and then he'd take a nap and like i love that so every year on hit the day of his death i think it's january 24th i celebrate winston churchill's life by living the way he did Mm-hmm. And so I have breakfast in bed with a soft scotch, and I just party all fucking day. That would be the guy to drink with. That would be the guy if you could pick anyone to drink with. I mean, what a fucking badass <laughs> thing! You know, he taught he taught the queen. The queen was like a like a like a window licking idiot, right? Like she was, yeah. she had a third grade education. So like, her dad dies, and she's like ten or twelve or whatever. The first thing they do is they pull her out of school. They're like, "You're done learning. You're just going to be the queen. You got to know this is what you need to learn. Don't make let people make eye contact with you. Yeah. Put your hand out like this. Don't let people touch you." So she like she had like a really. I saw the. I, by the way, I didn't do this research. I just watched The Crown. Okay, mm-hmm. and Winston Churchill kind of taught her about world politics, and was the, they like come in and she'd be like, "Winston, what did we do in Africa?" And he's like, oh, "This is going to be a tough one." And so yeah, so but Winston Churchill's the badass. But if I had to drink with someone living, like drink, and there's like there's a two obvious one. Like obviously it's fucking Kim Jong Un, right? You kind of want to. He drinks. No, he does. <laughs> <laughs> you think my IVs are good in the morning? You know Kim Jong Un's IVs are next. You're like I feel up, and he's like it's amphetamine. He would be a badass to drink with. I think like, he drinks hard liquor. Uh, it's, I think it's I Scotch. Heard. Johnny Walker Blue. That's what I've heard. <laughs> I don't know where you heard this, but I like this. Okay, so I say things like that, but then I'm sure I I I I, I, I don't know if you've ever partied with someone who just parties a little different than you, and then you notice like like sometimes celebrity like athletes, and then like you're at a strip club, and then they 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 talk weird to a woman. You're like, oh, that's not me. I'm so sorry. So that'd yeah. be the thing. The atrocities would be hard to get past with him. And I don't like I don't like a drinking meeting. Like when someone goes, <laughs> what's, like, what's the drinking meeting? Like, like what's that? When people go, like, hey, uh, I'm taking you out tonight. We're drinking. Yeah. And then I go, oh, I, that's not the way I like to do it. It gives me anxiety. Like, um, I'm gonna, our lives are very different. You and I? Yeah. Were you in a fraternity? No. <laughs> we could start there. No, I was not. Okay. <laughs> that's, 
And the differences continue from there, I'm sure. So when you get your pledge pin, uh huh, they take you out, and their whole thing is you're gonna you're, we're getting you fucked up. Yeah, that energy is not my energy. I don't like that. Like it's, I just go. Why don't we just get drunk and feel really good about ourselves? Like I never like took mushrooms to see Jesus. I just wanted to enjoy Rainex on a windshield. Mm-hmm. Like so, like that. That for me uh, is like one of my things. So I, if if Kim Jong Un flew me to North Korea to drink with him, I'd be like, I'd have to start really getting blackout drunk on the plane to enjoy drinking with him that day. <laughs> whiskey it's gonna be like a nice whiskey neat no i like it on the rocks and i like lots of rocks it won't be something expensive because rogan is not he's not a fancy boy you know like he's a real regular he's a really regular dude he's gotten less regular the more millions of dollars he has (laughs) i think there's parts of him where you're like yeah like where you're like oh wow we can do this yeah (laughs) um but he's a regular he'd he'd be like jack on the rocks or like probably buffalo trace or one of the maybe a little whiskey he's buying rogan be uh whiskey rocks and then like that's a good i I haven't hung out with joe by ourselves i take that back i was with him the other night but like i would be cool my times with joe's are are always on podcasts yeah and his i miss the times where it was where you just have you and him at at a at the store late night i enjoy it because of the people i could never sit down with ah like David Cross, I would never sit down with David Cross because we don't run in the same circles. And but it's nice he has something to promote, and, and then he comes to my house, and and then we can sit down for an hour and talk. And then I, and then or Kevin Smith, like people I would never really hang out with. Tom, um, I enjoy being alone with Tom more. Off mic, Tom lot. Segura. Yeah, we have a lot of history. There's a lot of. Th- things secrets we know about each other and there's a lot of secrets going on in our each other's lives that i would never share on podcasts that i that i can talk to him about Mm. and i really appreciate his and i know this isn't on brand of us beating each other up but like i really appreciate his insight as a as a dad and as a dude and as a son but but he makes me giggle harder than anyone so doing a podcast is fun so there's something on a podcast that's performative for you with him and then there's a part me and him because we're trying to make each other laugh. But I'll tell you, if we're going back to drinks, I'll tell you, like a great a great afternoon drink is a Campari Spritz. It's my one of my favorite drinks in the I world. I don't even know what that is. Oh. Campari Spritz. Campari is an interesting alcohol because I think it's a bitter uh, or it's a liqueur. And it's got a weird, rooty, earthy taste. It's mm-hmm. red, so it looks like Kool-Aid. That's why I got into it. I thought Campari on ice would be oh so nice. It was an old commercial. But man, it's fucking like sucking the green giant's dick. It is earthy. What's earthy? It's like it's it tastes like roots. It's <laughs> oh just, nice. It's not, it's not, it's oh, there's a bitterness and like a it's just not great. And then someone introduced me to a Negroni, which is Campari and gin and a little soda water, and then Campari spritz. Campari spritz is Campari prosecco and soda water Mm -hmm. in like a wine glass and it is so enjoyable it's got so many different profiles to it where you get the bitterness but the sweetness of the prosecco and then it flattens it out with the soda water and it looks like kool-aid so i love it that's one of my favorite drinks to share in what context oh uh you're in italy and you've been walking around venice and everyone went their own ways and the whole family comes back together and you meet at a statue and and your wife's sweating and she's uncomfortable mm-hmm. and your daughters are 16 and 18 and they're like oh, are, are, what are we going to what are we doing with the rest of the day and you go hey guys it's europe mm-hmm. does anyone want a campari spritz and everyone goes i don't know what that is and you go for campari spritz now it's a, it's a minor in alcohol so it's not going to light them up but it gives them a little bit of a buzz where they're like Dad, these are nice. Isla didn't drink hers, so I drank hers. I Georgia had hers. Leanne had hers. And we ordered another round. I ordered, an, and they're fucking refreshing. And the buzz is perfect. It's not too much because it's just a little bit of champagne and some Campari. It, the buzz is perfect. And then a couple of them, and then they kind of disappear. And then you're just walking around again. Mm-hmm. That's a great fucking drink. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Then, tell them, walk me through all the alone, and, yeah. and then I'll tell you the rest. There's all kinds. Of, there's all kinds of. There's a alone on a train, like yeah. transporting. I'm dragging alone plane, on a train. Yeah, train, plane, and then there's just alone in the 
in an empty home or a hotel room. Hotel. Oh, hotel and it's room. Sunday night. Sunday night. And you're packing your bag, and you got a flight at six a.m. Yeah. But Roadhouse is on, and you're like, shit. So you go down to the front desk and go, is the bar still open? And they go, yeah, can I order some to take to my room? Sure. How about six Heinekens? Six Heinekens? Yeah, my wife wanted one, too. She's not up there. (laughs) You murdered her. And you just say to yourself, I'm just getting six so that if I have four, I I just know I have two extra ones. And then you go through six, and you're like, oh, man, I'm not done yet. Dude, I've drank in every alone scenario you can possibly think of. I've drank... uh, I've drank alone in a helicopter with a dude who didn't know I was drinking. Uh, he was like, I was like, can I drink in here? And he was like, absolutely not. And then I poured it into a flask and opened it and drank it. And he's like, dude, we're in a fucking helicopter. You don't think I smell that? Mm-hmm. I've, the best alone drinking you can ever do, in my opinion, now we're getting into the weeds on it, mm-hmm. is alone behind someone's back. What do you mean? Like when they don't know you're drinking, but you're drinking. Hmm. Like uh, like Christmas shopping. Ah. Uh. <laughs> and, and your wife says, "All right, let's all split up." And you go, yeah. "Cool." And it's like it's like eleven o'clock on a Sunday, and they just opened that bar by the elevator in the Beverly Center. And you just sneak over and you go, "Hey, man, can I get a double jack on the Ross Ox Ross?" And they're like, "Sure." And you just have it, and you just go, "Let's just," and then you're yeah. off. And then you're like, yeah. "Yeah." And then you just a little sneak one, sneak yeah. it, sneak it, and then you're and then buzzed and nobody knows. And then your wife's like, "Wait, have you been drinking?" You're like, "Do I?" <laughs> yeah, I'm drinking by myself in a fucking mall. Yeah. On Christmas. How sad do you think I am? Yeah. And then you go, yeah, I am. Uh, what about mood? Do you ever drink in a, in a dark place? So I broke, I, I had a chick break up or a chick cheat on me uh, when I was, when I came back from Russia and she slept with my best friend and I didn't know how to deal with the emotions I had. And my buddy, Mike Osborne said, I can tell you this, if you drink, they go away. And I went, okay. And that was the first and kind of last time I ever did that because i did it i've done it i've done it a couple times but i try to avoid i try to avoid if there's emotion going to alcohol like meaning not when it's anxiety but like depression yeah i kind of sit in the depression because or anxiety i lean towards alcohol like anxiety like about flying or 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 just like getting worked up on over something but with depression i try to avoid alcohol and just sit in it um because I, I, because I've gone there before, I've, but anxiety is a, I land, I land all the time. But depression, heartbreak, all that, you just sit in the feeling. Yeah, heartbreak's a weird one for me. So like the last time I got my heart broken, it, Leanne dumped me. Mm-hmm. Um, we were dating for like four months, and she broke up with me. And my instinct was to have a drink. My friends went to this, uh, this uh, Middle Eastern restaurant, and I told them what was going on. And my buddy Corey's like, "Let's get a cocktail." And I was like, "I don't want one. I got to figure this out." Because I want this chick, and if I start drinking, I'll be like, ah, fuck it. So I got to figure it out. Like, I, I wonder, I'm going to find out my dad dies one day, or my mom. But my dad will be the rough one. My mom will be equally as rough. My dad and I are really close. And I wonder if, I've thought about this a lot, if I'll have a drink dealing with that. Like, I, I think about that a lot. I keep saying everything I get with my dad is extra. My dad, my dad had a, a 100% blockage in his Widowmaker twice. And both times they saved his life. And he got a stint, I think, 12 or 13 years ago. And then he just got a stint this last year. But so I, everything I get to do, I feel like is extra. And so, you know, he was just at the premiere of my movie and he got to see that. And he had a very emotional response. And I got to, I got that from him. And I was like, that that's a little icing on the cake I did. You know, the arena in Tampa was the first time you ever saw me do stand-up. That was like a little extra. So all these things I'm getting with him are all extra. So I have, a, you know, and he's 74. So, yeah, if, 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 that'll be a tough one. Well, at the premiere, he was, what, proud? Yeah, he came out. He was sobbing, crying. And he goes, I've underestimated you your whole life. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he was like, and he just, and he was shaking. Yeah. He goes, I just underestimated you. I didn't know. I didn't know. You. I didn't know you were this I didn't know whatever. It was, it was really hard to understand him, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't know totally what he said. He might have just not liked the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to make sense. I want to feel like sometimes I'm like a professional fucking wrestler. Because all I care about is you come and see me do stand-up. So I, whatever I got to do to get you there. But the number one thing, I, my one takeaway from that man's humility and... 
I applied, I've applied it in different ways throughout my career. On my 26th birthday, he gave me a really uh, aggressive speech. He, I, I was hungover and I just thought he was going to say Good, happy birthday. So I picked up the phone and I was like, hey. And he was like, you are a tremendous piece of shit. And he broke me off. You have no humility. You have no this. You have, you'll never succeed at anything. You, you're, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to everyone around you. You're not doing what you're going after your dream. I broke you. I failed you as a father. This and that. I was like, I thought you were going to wish me happy birthday. And so in that speech, he told me if I wanted something, I had to go at it. And I had to go after it as, as hard as I could. And I had to do whatever it could I, I could do to achieve that. In this case, it was working, offering to do anything at the comedy club to get on stage. <coughs> he told me, I told him, that's not how it works. And he said, no, that has, that's how it works for some poor kid from Harlem. Because that kid needs it. He goes, you've grown up with privilege your whole life. You don't need it. You think you're going to be fine. And so I went and I ended up getting a job at the door. But I, it was, it was, it was, it's humbling. It's, it's really like, uh, it's, it's makes me feel, it made me feel uncomfortable. And so that humility uh is it's the first time i really understood humility and i've applied that in many respects in like in like getting to be a, a, a paid regular at the comedy store that happened late in life for me which i think most people would give up and be like oh, fuck that I've, i'm already a touring comic i'm on tv i don't need that but it's something i wanted and i knew i wanted so i i just humbly went after it and then i think i i, I still apply it when it when it comes to selling tickets or, or 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 selling a project to to the fans or even to doing podcasts i try to be as honest as i can about whatever i'm going through or whatever i'm dealing with but when it comes to like selling things i don't have i don't have a problem trying to make fun of myself or or get in front of people so that they know that that i have a show cuz the thing i'm good at the the one thing i know i'm good at stand up and and i i say that humbly but like I want them to come there. So like I've heard people make fun of me like before they're like, yeah, I'm not some, I'm not some clown in a speedo who's one is going to, I'm a real comic. And I go, okay, but I'm, I want to, I want them at my shows and you can be that guy and I'll be this guy. Yeah. The clown in the speedo. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> what are you going to do? Funny people make fun of me for taking my shirt off. Like I guess behind my back, no one ever does it to me. Like no one would ever. Comics aren't, comics aren't, comics aren't that manly. <laughs> <laughs> well, more than anything i like being shirtless more than having a shirt i'm very uncomfortable in a shirt yeah like right now and i have tactile issues like i have legit tactile issues i'm most comfortable in stretchy jeans mm -hmm. with a loose fitting belt and then these shirts exactly, but I don't. I I like more like a V neck. I feel, I can feel this on my neck right yeah. now, and I can feel it on my arms. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'll sit a certain way because it, it it just rubs me wrong. But yeah, I'm more comfortable shirtless. I can never wear what you're wearing. Uh... Yeah, but it looks good on you. Does it? I don't know. You know, I think people think. I don't like they say like what what if you lose weight you can't take your shirt off anymore I go no I can fucking take my shirt off yeah you fucking out of your mind I'm gonna take my shirt off all the time uh, yeah what do you think about trust it's an interesting question um I've been betrayed in my professional life a couple times by really close friends and uh I'm not someone who can, like, I have a mantra that, I mean, I'm, I don't know if people have heard it or not, and I'm, I hate, I hate sharing it, but it's, but it's true. The mantra is, so you think I'm weak. Like, do you think, it's like, that's my thing, because I, I feel like people take advantage of me, and I go, oh, so you think I'm weak. You forget, everyone that, like, the, the, and I'm named the, the people that have betrayed me, I'm a larger man than all of them. And, and, but I, and so that's what really fucks with me, is I go, so you think I'm weak? Like where I grew up, when you do stuff, there was physical consequences. I grew up in Florida. Like I've, I've been beaten up a bunch. I'm not saying I can fight, but like I, I'm not scared of getting beaten up. And the the times that I've been betrayed, I and, and 
And even, I, I know, even like by Ari, whichever uh, people see that drugging as a betrayal, and I did for a period, but it was it was only because it was Ari and he was my, one of my best friends. And me and him had to work through that because I, I, I couldn't not love him. Like, I couldn't not have him in my life. He, me, he means a lot to me. He really does. He's a great friend to have. But he's also, I, I don't know what was going on with him at that time, but he made a bad decision. And I had to forgive him for that because I knew he, he knew my mantra. Mm -hmm. I think I'm harder to trust people now. I'm, I'm not as apt to trust people at all. But there was a moment, I, I don't know if I've ever shared this and I don't know how this will sound. But there was a moment that information got leaked about a thing and all my managers and agents, both both Tom and my Tom and our managers and agents would like to uh, separate either separate us mm -hmm. or one of us one of them get both of us. It's just more lucrative for them. Sure. So they have always kind of pitted us against each other a little bit, and they do it subtly. Mm -hmm. um, they'll do it to me and my team, and then his team will do it to me, and then my team will do it to him, and his team will do it to him. And there was a moment where information got leaked about this thing I was doing, and my team was like, just so you know, your your boy Tommy is is the rat. Mm -hmm. And I had to, it was the one time, and Leanne said, do you think Tom would do that? I said, uh, I don't know how faith works. Like, I'm not a super religious person, but I will tell you that I believe in Tom, and I don't think he did it. And I will stand by that ignorantly. And and I will and I will ride or die with him because I cannot live in a world where I don't trust him. Yeah. If I don't trust him, then I am so fucked. And uh, and it wasn't him. It wasn't him. And it was. It's a cool feeling to know that you could like that you could blindly trust someone, blindly have faith in someone, know that they're they have your best interest at heart. But yeah, it took me a while to get there. Rogan helped me get there because I wasn't trusting him or Joey or Tommy or anyone. I wasn't trusting anyone. I'd gotten in a bad thing and i just wasn't trusting anybody and rogan was like yo man we're trying to be your fucking friend and i was like yeah i don't i don't need friends i couldn't understand what why rogan was interested in me and i was yeah. i said to like someone i was like is he gay like, like <laughs> what the fuck yeah and then he was just a nice guy <laughs> he yeah. was just a nice guy <laughs> <laughs> that'd be hilarious if joe was sexually attracted to you this whole time <laughs> This whole time is the reason he keeps inviting you back. I would be more excited. I would be more excited if just to, if he tried to kiss me on the lips once, just yeah. and just and the, like in a, in, in a yeah. Scotty Scotty J way from Boogie Nights, where he's like, "What do you like my car?" Yeah, <laughs> you know nobody would believe that story. No one. Yeah. If I was Joe, I would kiss dudes yeah. all the time, and then be like, <laughs> and then and then when they didn't kiss back, go, oh, you know, no one will ever, no one will ever believe you. Yeah. Well, when you trust people like that. And they fuck you over. That can really, really, really hurt. You end up on a treadmill in a hotel room fighting with them. You fight with them all the time. You fight with them all the time. You fight with them constantly. And it's and I and I, I have this uh, thing like where I like ruminate on an idea and I can't get it out of my head. And I hear the words they say and I, and it, I and so all in your head on a treadmill in, in your head, just fighting, just fucking fighting, and then. Yeah. And then one day you get past it. Like one day you just go, eh, fuck them. I'm not going to let you give them real estate. And then you just forget about them. And then they reach out and they'll, they'll try to be a dick or a bully because they're bullies. They're bullies is what they are. Don't ever forget it. They're fucking bullies. And they got bullied. It's not their fault. They got bullied. And then they try to bully you and, you're, and you don't have any connection anymore. And you're like, oh, you can go fuck yourself. You can actually go fuck yourself. You're not my boss. You're not my wife. You don't fuck me. You don't pay me. Get the fuck out of my life. I am. I, am. I mean, that's the problem is I think I am pretty fucking weak. <laughs> like, I think I'm, not the, I'm not the strongest dude out there. I have really thin skin. I get my feelings hurt all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, but like, but it sucks when you watch, like, your friend see something in you that you go, or they go, oh, fuck him. He's not paying attention. Fuck him. Let's just fuck him. Let's take his money. You know what? Fuck him. I, he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Look at him. He's a drunk alcoholic. And you go, oh, no, bitch. I pay attention. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm wide awake. I'm here. I'm working my ass off. You're not going to fucking. It's really tough. It's really tough. For, you know, especially as we're growing. And, and uh, I'll tell you what. 
I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but I can tell you this. We had a business deal where feelings were getting involved and money was involved and that, and the money was causing the feelings. And one of us said to the other person, our feelings are more important than the money. Mm -hmm. So let's just split the money. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was, and it was, and, and, and it was, it was really like a solid moment where I, where both of us were like, that is how we should run this. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because like, I couldn't do it without him. He couldn't do it without me. We do it separately. We'll have guest bears on. Yeah. Some will blow up. Some won't. You can never figure it out. But when we're together, it does well. Mm -hmm. And so we need each other for it to work. And we've, you know, like I said, we're on a handshake deal with two bears. And no one likes that. But we're like, hey. I mean, we, I don't like, I, to the point where, I, like, he'll call me and go, yo, we have a deal to do this for X amount. Are you in? Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah. I don't check the books. I don't need to. I don't, I don't, I know him. I just know him. Yeah. What do you love most about Tom Segura? The, we saw a gay couple one time. Mm -hmm. This is a good start. And there was one guy was in khakis and one guy was in jean shorts with a python around his neck. Yeah. And Tom goes, if we were gay, which one would you be? I said, I'm fucking python. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I'm khaki. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah, that's why we work. And he goes, all relations are for pythons and khakis. And I went, really? And he goes, look at you and Leanne. Who do you think you are? I go, I'm <laughs> python. And he goes, she's khaki. And he goes, me and Push? I go, oh, she's python. He goes, and I'm khaki. Yeah. He goes, I'll always be khaki. And sometimes I'll have a relationship where I'm the python, but it's I'm usually a khaki. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I am a little bit of a lunatic. I, I'll tell you the one of the, the a moment that explains me and him that the world will never see. It was just a great moment. We got stem cells with Rogan one weekend mm -hmm. yep. and one day. And I'd had surgery in my arm and I didn't want to do it. I was terrified. And Tom just said, just come out and meet up with us. Tom knew he was going to make me get them. Mm -hmm. And so I got them. And he, and you know, Joe's there. And so we're just all talking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and Tom can see that I'm spinning out a little bit. And I get in the car and, you know, Tom's got a Porsche. So we're like right next to each other. And I just want to feel if it's swollen. And it is a little swollen because I just got an injection. And then, and Tom's driving and he's got his hand on the thing. He just puts his hand on my arm and he goes, you're okay. <laughs> he, he just, he's watching. He knows me so well yeah. that he knows that I'm spinning out of control. And he's like, you're okay. And then I was like, and I felt okay. I was like, you're right. I'm okay. What the fuck am I doing? My brain's that brain. Man, that guy got so much love in him. Dude, he does. He has, uh, you know, he had a fantastic relationship with his dad, and 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 I think whatever that did that dude did to create that dude, he hit it out of the fucking park because he has so much uh, love that he doesn't need reciprocated like at all. Like he can just love. And then he it feels good for him to give mm -hmm. and to like take care of someone. And like, you know, he started the whole birthday gift thing because, and he didn't need to. He just was like, hey, man, I had this bike. I thought you'd like it. And then, of course, I've turned it into a fucking bit. <laughs> and now we're upside down. I'm 120 upside down on a fucking race car that we can't make our money back on. I <laughs> uh, love it. Uh, what do you love most about Joe Rogan? Oh, that dude. I could go on and on about Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is the most selfless individual I've ever met. He doesn't care if he has you on the podcast. He wants you to be the funniest person in the room. He wants you to be the smartest person in the room. Let me tell you something. Joe Rogan is 10 times smarter and funnier than me. He wants you to shine. He wants you, he wants to put you over to his fans. He That shit did not exist before he started doing his podcast. People didn't share you with their fans. No one was like, hey, man, come on on the road with me. They brought you on the road because they wanted you to suck, and they put you in bad scenarios. Joe Rogan wanted you to shine. He gave he gave so many people beautiful careers. Gave them careers. Gave them. Joe could have looked at his podcast as his thing. This is my thing. I bring on... These guys, I'm going to be the funniest guy in the fucking room. I know some guys that have done that. It might be me. I might, <laughs> might be I might talk over people and not listen really well. Joe had, did the opposite. Now, look, I've tried to learn from Joe on my podcast and do the same. 
That guy, when I mean, you think about it, you name 10 of his friends, I, I bet eight of them are doing arenas right now. Mm -hmm. They're all doing theaters. All his friends do theaters. All his friends do theaters. He is, he is just, you know, I, 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 he, and he won't accept this compliment. I tried paying it to him uh, in, in, in Austin when I was in Austin last well, night. Well, he's not good at accepting compliments. I gave him a gift too, and I said, hey, I, I, need, I need to show you I can't just tell you this because it's going to fall in deaf ears. I need to give you a minute so you have something so you know that I think about you and I'm grateful for having you in my life a lot for many reasons. I have more friends in my life because of you. He taught me how to trust people again. I have a career because of you. I have a major motion picture because of you. I do arenas because of you. Without you in my life, a lot of these, these things maybe never would have happened. I never would have told the machine on stage. I wouldn't have gotten, I would have never started a podcast. I wouldn't have three podcasts. Like, I mean, all these things are, are things he not just, he didn't just take me to the water one time and give me a drink. He he gave me a machete and he said, this is how I get to the water. Mm -hmm. You got to put cut your own path, but just giving you a heads up, you can also use my path whenever you want. I mean, he he is the most selfless individual he will go down in history as one of the 10 most important people in stand-up comedy without a doubt he changed the game it didn't exist like this before him and uh and he won't accept that compliment what was he, the gift you gave him i can't tell you is it a dildo it was a dildo it was okay. a double-sided dildo i go hey when you get free time can we scissor fuck each other <laughs> uh this is gonna sound off <laughs> but don't don't tie yourself down meaning like don't spend time fucking with those little mini shrimp and peeling them every night mm -hmm. when you know you're looking for a lobster yeah like and so i think what happens to a lot of guys they just they're so busy and like just getting pussy and going from here to here to here yeah. i was never that guy i always wanted i always wanted to find someone who understood me i always wanted that mm -hmm. And so, you know, granted, I haven't had sex with a lot of chicks, but that's, and it's, and it's not by choice. I mean, I'm saying like, maybe there was times I would have done it, but I, but I know that I was always looking for someone to figure out, to get me. And then, and then I will say this, when you know, you know, when you know, you know, when you think there's, I can't imagine a life without this person that, that, that happened to me. And I, I can only say my experiences, I had Leanne. I loved her, I, and I and I didn't even realize it. And the second I, she dumped me, I went, "Oh no, 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 no! Oh, I I don't get to live a great life without her. She's the thing that's going to give me a great life." I knew it, undisputed. I, I went for a run, and I, I, she dumped me. I went to my shower. I cried. I went to Barnes and Noble. I bought Men Are from Venus, Women Are from Mars. I watched Fight Club in my closet. Yeah. I didn't drink. I, I drank a lot of Nyquil to sleep, and then I went for a hike. In, uh, in Runyon Canyon, I was running back down Outpost by Beneflex House, and and the sun was setting, and I just said, hey, God, if you're listening, just give me this chick back. I'll never fuck it up. This is the one. I won't fuck it up. I won't cheat. I'm not going to be a bad dude. I want to have kids with her. I'm, I'll be there. I'll be a great fucking dude. I'll take her out on dates. Like, I'll love this chick. And I got home, and she was in my room in a sundress. Yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck. He I didn't know he was real. Yeah. I was like, shit, man. Give me like one more night. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me get some strange tale real quick yeah. before I commit forever. But I think when you know, you know. I, this is so silly, but I follow that in business. Like when you know, you know. And like my assistant's with us. And someone goes, how did you? How do you find a good assistant? And I go, when you know, you know. Like people will show you who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you when I fell in love with my assistant. <laughs> we were doing a TV show and 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 that we worked past dinner and all the dinner places were closed. Yeah. And he just said, "Hey, I got like four meals. I didn't know which one you'd want, so I got four different meals for you. I ordered them. They're up in your room, and just let me know whichever you want. I'll, I'll take care of the rest of them." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, that that dude thinks about other people before himself. He didn't even get himself dinner. He just got me four dinners." And I was like, "Fuck." Yeah. I, I did the same thing with my my social media manager. The way she was operating was, I was like, I feel like she's thinking about me. Yeah. And we connected on so many levels, on so many levels. I could talk to her about things and ideas I had. And then I was like, okay, I want her. I want him. I want, I think you, I think it's got to be that thing when you know, you know. And it can be so simple as like, like a personal trainer or like a, a jujitsu class or like just where you go, oh, I'm connecting right now. 
But you have to allow yourself to notice that person. You, I, I think you do. I mean, I think you have to put yourself out there and you have to be available for it. You know, that's the hardest part is just being available for it. Because so, so many people just want to be busy just dating. Yeah. I just want to have someone in my life. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to, what if I die alone? I don't want to, I, I like, just be available for it. Wow. Yeah, but well, they, yeah, but it's lobster. <laughs> so this is a fucking baby shrimp. Or like, you ever get so you ever get the ones in Brazil where you just go fuck it, I'll eat the shell. I don't care anymore. <laughs> like I'm so fucking hungry, you just handful of lobster like it's popcorn or baby shrimp like it's popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that in Vietnam. I've done that where I just go. It's too much work. Oh fuck, that's I'm the wrong guy to answer that. I think how to I'm, make love to a woman. By Burke Kreischer. How do you make love to a woman? I'll tell you how I do it. Yeah. Uh, I go down on her first. <laughs> make sure she has an orgasm. Yeah. And then I get my turn, and that's over pretty quick. <laughs> it's like a, it's like get your ears pierced. It'll feel a little prick, and it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I don't know if I've done a great job keeping her happy. I think I keep her interested. Like I think I I I I, I keep her occupied. Like I'm like a ro a little bit of a rodeo clown. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know. I mean, like I I, th I know we're happy right now. I know we're really happy, but I don't know if I ever did as good a job as she did. Like she's always been, like she's always been a gangster. Like done did everything. Just does everything. She does it all. She does everything like fucking everything and she loves it she just does it mm -hmm. and then she shows love for you by taking care of you and so like i have a lot of time just been this like almost like step and repeat husband where it's like i come in to take a picture like hey monday tuesday all right i'm on the road wednesday take care guys or like travel channel i'd leave for two weeks at a time i left for the movie for three months so like i don't know that i've ever done a bang up job I buy it like I I go. I remember one time I was just like, I don't cheat on her. I don't hit her. I don't yell at her. I'm a pretty good fighter. I'm a really good fighter. Like, like I'm good at like going like, hey, we're on the same team. Oh, you mean de escalation? I'm really good at like, I'm very self, I'm very accountable. I'm very self correcting. Like, if, if we're in a fight and she points something out and I go, oh, you're right. I go, fuck, you're right about that. You're right. You're totally right. Oh, in the moment. In It'll the moment, I'm really good at that. Huh. and my wife's not she's not a good apologizer like she needs to sleep on an apology and then she can do it i can apologize in the moment if i realize i'm wrong and i'm really quick to find my fault yeah i look for my fault because i go tell me what i did adversely as a parent i have pulled my daughters aside and been like yo that wasn't you that was mom yeah i'm giving you a heads up because i don't want because I, I got really confused as a kid because my dad always made sure i knew i was wrong and sometimes i wasn't yeah and then as a kid you're kind of fucked up and you're like well how do i know if i'm wrong and i think that raises so I, I was really good with my girls going like yo and then and then parenting georgia taught me a lot about self-correcting self-correcting was that my oldest i'd only i parented like my dad parented like just like raise your voice get up to here that's it no that does it fuck this yeah. how come the dogs don't have goddamn leashes or collars on their necks and so with Georgia, I had to learn through therapy that if the if the if the consequence is here, and it and the highest it goes is here, then why the fuck wouldn't they lie and do everything? Because they go, well, I know what it's like to hear, but if you can vary your consequence with a child and find some conversation in it, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they're like, well, fuck. Well, I don't want to lie because this does this does suck. I, I like this. I like where we talk, and he says, right a thousand words on why driving around your kids in a car kids in a car is bad so threaten extreme violence every once in a while just to yeah let them know the dog can fucking bite yeah the dog can bark the dog can bite but if you pet him on his belly he'll wag its tail <laughs> yeah i feel like sometimes it cannibalizes your real life where you start going you start thinking in promo videos or you start yeah. looking at a vacation as a bit yeah. Like we should go zip lining. Yeah. Uh, well, Ida, why, well, why don't you do? Uh, what shoes are you wearing? I like. <clears throat> it can it can definitely cannibalize your life. My wife's really good at going like, no, like no phones, 
the girls were really good. The girls, when I started Instagramming stuff, they started saying stuff like, dad hits mom. And I'm like, whoa, 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 guys. They're like, no, put your phone away. Yeah. Dad, dad molests boys. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I think the number one thing is don't be afraid to suck. No one sees the shit that sucks. Doesn't get views. It just gets forgotten. Yeah, gets forgotten. The good stuff they remember, and then that's all they bring up. The stuff that sucks just goes away. And they're like, oh, yeah, did you do that? I, I don't even think I saw that. <laughs> Fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like it's like I, I watched I, I, one of my favorite stories about this is uh, a guy named uh, Sean Patton. I was explaining Instagram stories to him and Ari and Mark Norman. And I was explaining that you can set now sell tickets on Instagram stories. It was a, back when they swiped up instead of tap the button, swipe up. And they didn't understand it. And I said, let me show you. And I put up tickets for sale. And I said, you know, hey, guys, swipe up. And then I just showed him in 10 minutes. Look, this is how many people swiped up. It's 145 people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people to buy tickets for a fucking comedy club. And they were like, whoa. And they're like, well, how, what do you do stories about? I go, fucking anything. Who gives a shit? Just anything. And some things work. Some things don't. And I watched Sean Patton, shout out to Sean Patton, try for about 15 minutes to do an Instagram story about uh, his t cup of tea. Mm -hmm. He was making a cup of tea and he was making and he kept going, hey, you got okay, hold on, fucking, hold on, let me. <laughs> yeah. I was filming him from the couch. Yeah. I was filming all these attempts. The whole thing, yeah. I filmed every single one of my like 15 different stories of him trying to do that. I had 145,000 views on each story. Mm -hmm. He never posted it. He never posted it. And I was like, I was like, man, if he had just posted that one, he never posted anything in his stories. Yeah. That one, 145, 5,000 people would have gone to his story to see that cup of tea being made yeah. and see which one he finally went with. And so sometimes I think the biggest mistake you can make is just not doing it. Just do it. Just post it. Turn the camera on. The idea will show up. And that, that's the number one thing. Just turn the camera on and it'll come up. You'll figure it out. Do you do multiple takes or no? I, maybe I do three. Like, And I'm talking even like in the, the dance video I did. Where I did the hip hop dance, I did yeah, two correct. takes on that. Mm -hmm. um, with when I had the marching band come to my house, I did two takes on that. Um, once you start doing more takes, you you lose the fun of it, yeah. I think. And uh, and then the fun ones. I mean, my favorite one I've ever done, without a doubt, my favorite promo I've ever done is uh, I needed. They added a second show in some city, and uh, and. And they had a second show like Friday and Saturday and our third show. And I said, I, they just told me, I was like, fuck, I'm leaving like tomorrow. I need to sell tickets. So I said, real quick, girls, meet me outside. And Leanne's like, the girls are doing homework. I go to take five seconds. I put on a Speedo. I got the American flag. I gave Isla the hose. I gave Leanne the leaf blower. And I gave Georgia the drone. Mm -hmm. And I just had Georgia drone it back to reveal the leaf blower and the, the mist you were seeing was coming from Isla and Leanne. Yeah. I'm in a speedo with the American flag. I have Bob Seeger playing rambling, grambling man. Yeah. And, and that night, Larry, the cable guy texted me and he goes, this is fucking genius. And I was like, it was just, and it was just like, yo, just, let's just shoot something. Who gives a fuck? Like, just shoot something. Just, just, just say something and, 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 and put a little, just do a little movement into it. And, mm -hmm. And those are my, back in the, I was, I used to be, I watched a bunch of my promo clips back from back in the day. I used to be really good. Now it's like, I'm promoting so fucking many things. I'm just like, I'm almost like, I'm exhausted about my promotions. Yeah, because, you know, the, the well can dry up in terms of ideas. Yeah, and it's like, how many times am I going to show a picture of my ass? My ass sells really good. That's Whatever my ass is on Instagram, fucking million views guaranteed. A million views. Your ass. And, 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 and. Inter and it's and it's an active post. Like people are like, I did the best one I did the other day was where I superimposed my ass on my front, mm -hmm. and it just looked beautiful. Yeah, no views. Oh, so you I think it got reported? Oh, I it see. It looked like a front vagina. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, I think so. But like, <laughs> but yeah, my ass. ass I mean, sells. I, I, like I'm I'm at a place right now where I am promoting. I'll be promoting this movie. I'll be pr promoting this movie until it goes to a streamer. Mm -hmm. I'll be promoting it uh shamelessly i am proud of it I, I had a great time shooting it it's in theaters it'll be on video on demand it'll be on a streamer i'm sure i don't know but i'm sure i'm promoting fully loaded my summer festival with 19 mm -hmm. different comics i'm promoting uh, the tops off world tour that starts again this fall i'm promoting my cruise the fully loaded cruise i'm promoting red rocks i'm promoting so many things that today was the very first time in my career where i said 
in January, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a break and go like, hey, man, let's let's get your resting heart rate down. Yeah. Let's let's get some sleep. Let's let's maybe take off like three months from drinking. Like let's just really like slow it down and 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 also not think when you're thinking in promo all the time. It it can be a little exhaust. I mean, you think you think it's exhausting to look at my feed. It's exhausting to be my feed. I'm my feed. Yeah, yeah. 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 And how seldom he does his podcast. Because you're right, less is more. How, what does he do it like once a month? Yeah, no, true. he does it three times a fucking week. Yeah, less more but, but, is but. more is more is perfect. <laughs> it's the same day. It's the same. It's elk with a bunch of jalapenos, a knife that he had sent to him by a fucking knife maker, and him going, "Look at this! Look at this uh, Traeger smoker! I reverse seared this. This is what's great. Look at this! I'm about to put it in the butter. And <laughs> like this is grass fed butter. This elk really raises my testosterone." Rogan is. It's you're right with guys like Rogan when he does do a story, it, they're a little precious. Do you remember when he, this is like, like I can get in the weeds on Rogan, but, and especially when it's Instagram, do you remember when he got his polar plunge and he couldn't sit it in a minute Mm -hmm. and then the next day, and then he must've gotten it on the internet bad. Yeah. He must've gotten it bad. Yeah. The next day he sat in for 20 minutes and he lowered his core temperature by like two degrees and it took him like a month to get that back. Yeah. That is that fucking man. What an interesting, you know, I told you at the beginning, we were just talking. I like, I really enjoy, I draw inspiration for men I'm not like. Mm-hmm. Um, you, David Goggins, Cam Haynes. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew Huberman. We're talking I, Huberman I love. Uh, 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 fucking, I mean, there's so many guys like that. Rogan, you know, you do Tim Kennedy. Like, there are a lot of guys that are, like, just very different men than me. And I love Jocko Wilnick. Mm-hmm. Like, I love... I love reading their stuff or listening to their audio books or what, listening to their podcast because I'm so not like that. Mm-hmm. But that to, for me, when I add a little bit of that in my life, like I remember you went to, I don't know what you were doing, but you were walking us through your day mm-hmm. and it was so fascinating. <laughs> it was like, it was like I, I ran eight miles today. Yeah. I listened to an audio book while I was running eight miles and then I came and I worked for about three hours straight on AI stuff. And I'm like, and I was like, wait, you sat at a desk? Mm-hmm. Like you like sat at a desk and like, and I I actually, I wouldn't even know what to do. I I would start doing crafts. Like I wouldn't, <laughs> like to, that you went, I, I was like, you, is your computer? Like, yeah. Have you sat for like four hours focused on a single task? Me? Yeah. In- no. <laughs> no oh i have a hard time sleeping for four hours <laughs> yeah like I, I i don't have that i i don't have a brain that like i, I really admired it when i listened to you do it because then you were like you're taught you were fasting at the time you're mm-hmm. doing your fast and then you talk about what you ate mm-hmm. and I, I was jealous so i wanted to be able to be like that and i think at that time we started i think you were doing maybe bone broth or something yeah. mm-hmm. and we started doing bone broth pretty religiously and, and adding that into a fast because i was like it does for someone like me. It does feel cool to add a little bit of control into life. Mm-hmm. So you, my life. so integrating a little bit of a way of being from another person that you're not like. Yeah, like like uh, like so. So David Goggins is consistently pushing himself. I love. I did it. I did it over the pandemic more. But I loved going. Today I'm running a marathon. I'm gonna get on the treadmill, and it's not, it's not gonna be all at once. But I'm gonna get through a marathon today. So let's get up. Give us six months some coffee and let's see if we can do like five miles and then know that we started there. And th- that was really fun to, to, to like, um, Cam Haynes does that too, where he goes like, he almost just sets the limit and then, and then achieves that. His son Truett is really fascinating because his son Truett's right now is trying to get the, and like, I bet people would never think that this is who I watch, but I get real inspiration from those people because I showed Jocko, I showed a clip to Jocko to Isla because Isla's like me. Like, like a a person of her fluids, mm-hmm. impulse. I w- I walked in on her one time. She was in the pantry in a bathrobe, in the dark, drinking a root beer. Yeah. And I opened the door, and she went. <sighs> I said, "What?" She goes, "I thought you were mom." Shut the door. And I shut the door, 
to let her finish the root beer. Yeah. She has a hard time waking up. So we go, Isla, come in here. I want you to see this clip from Jocko. She goes, who's Jocko? I said, he's a Navy SEAL. She goes, he works at the zoo? I went, no. <laughs> I go, he's a Navy fucking SEAL. I go, it's a badass job. She goes, it's a silly name. And I went, no, it's not. It isn't a silly name. These guys are the toughest dudes in the world. Mm -hmm. She goes. It's She's kind of right, though, about the silly name. I never yeah. even realized that. Well, yeah, you talk to a child. Yeah. And so I go, watch just what he says about waking up. So it hits the thing, and Jocko goes, first thing you do when you hear that alarm clock, you could roll over. You could go back to bed. You could hit snooze, but you get out of bed, and that's your first victory. And Isla hits pause, and she goes, how great is that nap right after you hit snooze, though? Yeah, I went, yeah. It is pretty funny. So I go, hang yeah, on. It is great. You're missing the point. You yeah. need to listen to this whole speech. <laughs> he's with Casey Neistat when he's telling this speech. He's with Casey Neistat. Yeah. And uh, so I hit it. And then he goes, and then you've got a victory under your belt. And then you go to the gym and you work out. And I go, you listen to this, Isla? And she goes, yeah. And he goes, and then when you go to the work, now you've got two victories. You've worked out and you've woken up on time. You didn't mm -hmm. hit that snooze button. So when you go into that break room and you see donuts and she hits pause, she goes, um, if he's about to say no to donuts, I'm done listening. <laughs> I go, he's definitely going to say no to donuts. <laughs> Do you think he's going to have a donut? And she goes, you like this guy? I go, I fucking love him. And she goes, do you think he'd like you? And I go, what do you mean? She goes, dad, you hit snooze, you skip working out, and you love donuts. And I'm like, yeah, you're making a good fucking point. I go, I, but I, but I do love that. Like, I love to watch that brain work mm -hmm. and go like, like, I don't, I don't hit snooze. Like I don't hit snooze now. I go fuck it because I'm up. But I and, and then and then I go to the gym every single morning. I go to the gym every single morning. And today is National Donut Day. I didn't have a donut. And so like I I like I try I like try to apply these a little bit because I I mean the other side of me is like tonight after we do this I'll do another podcast and then I'm gonna call Leanne and go yo we're in Beverly Hills meet me out here mm -hmm. let's go have drinks let's go have a fucking couple Campari spritz. <laughs> let's, I was over at a friend's house and overnight. Let's get some edibles and let's fucking have a night about it. Yeah. Get some sushi. Go have sex in the hot tub. And I got to work out at fucking 10 in the morning. I got to tell you, that nap when you press snooze. Is the sweetest. That's my, that's my victory. First victory is pressing snooze and getting the nap out of the belt. I, have you ever had, I had, so this this morning I didn't work, I didn't work out. I had pressed at like five in the morning until about six. You're going hard right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Movie. And then I, I had a I podcast. Saw you flew to Austin. I was like, what? How? Yeah. What? <laughs> Just run around theaters, and now you're back. Yeah, run around theaters to do to f promote the movie, and then look. You only get one shot at these movies, yeah. so you might as well. Do it. And look, it's really hard to get people to go into a movie theater right now. Mm -hmm. And so, I woke up at like six, did five or six to seven, did press, and then I went. And I said, and I'm really into uh, podcast uh, history podcast right now. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to this one about the conquistadors. And I was, and I was like, before when I woke up, I was like, I wouldn't mind going back to that. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take a little nap and go. Now I slept good last night. I slept like seven hours last night. Boy, that 30 minute nap, it felt like five hours. Mm -hmm. And I woke up going. I got to readjust my sleep score. That has to be in the 97. That was the best fucking nap. Those yeah. little snooze naps are monsters. Have you ever slept in a tour bus? A tour bus versus a regular bus? Like a tour bus. Like meaning like was in a bunk. No. I've That's taken a lot of buses in my life, though. Like mean like just like a, like a Greyhound? A Greyhound. Those are very different. And uh, Where people public pick transit. Pocket. Listen, they. That's <laughs> just part of part of life on a Greyhound. I was on a Greyhound one time. I was on a Greyhound pockets. one time, right when Notorious B.I.G.'s album came out in college, mm -hmm. and I was going from Tallahassee down to Tampa, and the dude got on the tour bus, got on the bus next to me, black dude, and he sat down. He said, "Where are you headed?" And I said, "Tampa." He said, "You grew up in Tampa?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "You?" And he goes, "Yeah." I said, you go to school at FAM? And because at FAMU and Florida State, the two schools, one's black, one's white. And he goes, no, I just got out of prison. I said, you got a prison? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, man, I got out of prison. I stabbed a dude, and uh, and uh, and I've been in prison. I just got out today. He goes, what are you listening to? I said, N Notorious B.I.G.? And he goes, oh, shit. That's out? And I went, yeah. And he goes, I want to hear it. Can I hear it? And I was like, yeah. 
And he used my headsets the whole bus ride to Tampa. I didn't have the. I was like, he stabbed a man. They're yours now, yeah. I guess. And then I just sat next to him, and I was like, "Is he, are you enjoying it?" He's like, "This is good." No tour bus naps. Yeah. <laughs> when you're in a bunk, it's ice cold. Bus isn't moving. Five o'clock. You got, like we work out from like up until like five o'clock, five thirty. Show starts at seven, but that five o'clock to six, six thirty nap, it's pitch black. It's like a coffin. Mm -hmm. And it is ice cold. And you got all your pillows and blankets in there. And you put a little history podcast on in the corner. And you just listen to like Kurt Mimbashi or, or like, oh my God. So you're talking about like 5, 6 p.m. for a 7 p.m. show. Oh, it's the best yeah. nap you'll ever have. You wake up so refreshed. Yeah. Like I've woken up from naps like where I'm like, fuck yeah. Like yeah. They're those, those tour bus naps are the best naps. Yeah. I think i fucked up my podcast rhythm because we're doing them in the day yeah and so sometimes i'm just like I, like if i work out in the morning i'm good on a podcast but if i don't work out i suck on a podcast and i'm just like uh-huh yeah yeah that's cool no i i i'm my favorite is i used to do this a lot i haven't done it in a while is uh full busy day nap at home mm -hmm. box of wine on the treadmill and do that until like midnight, watching TV, box of wine. Box of wine <sighs> on a treadmill. It's the best. How are you, wait, how are you sipping it, Jake? You, you have a glass, but you have a box. The box fits yeah. on the corner on the treadmill. Of so you it's it got does. a little spigot. Yeah. And you just sit there and just put on like guys' grocery games or like just something. It's like a- You walking like a, or are you running? I walk. I walk at like a three, five. So what will happen is if you start at a three, start at a three, casual walk, 20 minutes, you're getting a mile in, and then you're, and you're going to feel loose. Mm -hmm. Get up to a three, five. You can do seven miles on these things and just, and just, and you're just enjoying your night. Especially like my wife back in the day when we lived in our old house, my wife would come into the man cave and she'd sit on the couch and we watch TV together yeah. and like watch Game of Thrones and you just like for an hour and you just get on the treadmill and do it. Oh man, I, I loved, I haven't done that as much lately. That was the fucking So you can lose yourself. You can forget yourself. <sighs> you forget you're on a treadmill yeah. and you just are like walking and I you're sweating and you're, and you're having wine. And then at certain points you're like. Like uh, you like you you start jogging, especially like we were watching uh, not all quiet on the Western Front. What's the one where they've got to they've got to get the message to the front line? I would run like I was in World War Two. Yeah, I would run when they would run, and it was fucking awesome. And I would be like, because they were doing drinks, they'd be like, "Take a drink, you got to run up there," and I'd be like, "Okay, yeah." I'm really into I'm really into history podcasts right now. Like I've been in them for a while. 20th century or everything? Everything. Everything. I listened to, um, uh, was it Marcus Aurelius and Cleopatra mm -hmm. today? Uh, in the middle of the podcast, they're like, you know, just so you know, Cleopatra wasn't as hot as everyone says. I was like, why are you saying that? Yeah, tell me she's a six. She looked like Snooki. Yeah. Like, I, why? Let me, let me dream that she looked like Kim Kardashian. Yeah. And then, uh, I listened to that one today. I listen to World War II a lot. Oh. A lot of books on World War II, a lot of uh, podcasts about it. What's your favorite theater, the Pacific or, or European? Uh, no, European. I Pacific, well, because my family's so much of it has died in that theater. So, Dude, person, so much of it. I, I hate to sound cliche, like I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger in an 80s movie, but it's personal. Can you, well, you know what I find funny about that? Yeah. Is Lenin, it was Lenin, right? Uh, John Lennon? Or no, no, the no. Other one? Was it Lennon was World War II, right? Or was it Stalin? Uh, Stalin. 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 Yeah. Stalin. Yeah. Stalin thought him and Hitler would be friends. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so cute that yeah. he was like, we're going to be buddies. Yeah. Like, we're boys. Yeah. And then Hitler's like, oh, fuck you. Yeah. I'm Hitler, bro. This is what I do. Well, at first he was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be friends. Yeah, yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure. And then call me. Call me. Better yet, I'll show up in winter. How's that sound? <laughs> yeah. The, that, uh that uh i find that i find all of that so fascinating when i was a kid i had a hard time understanding how because we were always at war with russia when i was a kid and i had a hard time understanding how we could be on the same team as russia in world war ii and i was like wait how did that turn south and then you guys listen to podcasts mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm that all of that all of that like all of the world war ii i, I got really into the the pacific shit for a while but I'm really deep in the, in 
and uh, the whole we 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 went to Normandy from the the D- cliffs of Dover, mm-hmm. and to think so that's the fucking beach. That's the fucking beach. Oh shit, this is cold as fuck. Mm-hmm. These dudes jumped in ice cold water. Yeah, and this isn't like a cool beach. Like this is, and it's just so insane. To and then to see like the the it, it's pretty intense. I, I don't know why I got into history late in life. I wasn't. I was kind of into it. But I'm really into it now. And I love just learning a little something about, you know, today was, I listened to like the, Noiser has a great history stuff. It's like du- history for dummies, I think. <laughs> like I, I get to, I can't listen to the really smart stuff. It starts losing me. Too many names and I'm gone. Yeah. Well, Dan Carlin is always the best. Your podcast with Dan Carlin. Yeah. Was so fucking good. Yeah. He is he is, I mean, I only know about Martin Luther because of Dan Carlin. I only know, like I would have, I made a joke about some Lutheran the other day and everyone laughed and I was like, did you guys listen to the same podcast I did? Because I just am quoting Dan Carlin. I, that, his podcast, I mean, we all quoted the same shit about uh, Genghis Khan, about how he could shoot a dove off a horseback, but we knew that all four hoofs had to be off the ground at the same time yeah. they shot. They would sometimes take their meat and stick it under their saddles. And that, I mean, Dan yeah. Carlin is, he is the motherfucker. Yeah. God, those were, man, discovering podcasts was the coolest time of my life. I, I talked about, I talked to it with them, about Daniel Patelli, and, and I guess, his thing is, he I get I guess his his hang up is Carlin's is he's not a he he's not like this like he doesn't feel like he's a real historian yeah but he is yeah I mean he's it's the way he shares the story look we had a history teacher in seventh grade who was a con artist and he came and taught our seventh grade and it was told con artist all he taught us about was barnstorming barnstorming and the JFK assassination <laughs> I walked away. Having such an appreciation for barnstorming, a very small blip on Americana, but I know a lot about barnstorming because of this guy, and he because he was passionate about barnstorming. It was the funnest day, seventh grade history class I'll ever take in my entire life. Uh, you mentioned tour bus. Uh, what's the best road trip you've been on? Have you have you driven across the country? Just you? No. We had one road trip in college where a bar had burned down. And we found out that the alcohol was still in the bar. Yeah. So we took my Jetta over to the bar and we emptied out the bar of all the burnt up liquor. We didn't know what anything was. We threw it into the trunk with no clothes, like no, no clothes. And we said, let's just start driving. And we drove from Tallahassee and ended up in West Virginia Mm -hmm. and just, just drove, just drove. It was like five dudes. We drank. One person drove. I I, I wasn't a big drinker. This sounds kind of crazy. I wasn't a big drinker in college until I went to Russia, mm-hmm. and so I drove the majority of the way. And then we we get somewhere, and and we get a hotel room, and it was one of the most epic fucking weekends of just debauchery and chaos. And I think we took mushrooms, and we 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 uh, went down a river in tubes. <laughs> Yeah, and it was when it was when I was like I was, I was trying to be a poet at that time, and so like we were actual poetry. Yeah, it was a really bad part of my life. I was just well, you were like is like music is there too somewhere. Yeah, I tried to be in a band too. That didn't work out the way I wanted it to. I just was never. I always was. I was never the. I'm not a good serious person. Like I'm a good funny person. I'm good to be the fool, but I'm not good when I try to be serious. It looks foolish, and so even like you know, someone said uh, showed me throwing out the first pitch the other day. As something, and all I could see is my gut flying everywhere, and I was like, "That's why it went viral." I was like, "Fuck!" I thought it was my throwing style. <laughs> that was a pretty epic one. The best road trips I ever took was during the pandemic. During the pandemic, yeah. when we were, when when we would, we were doing that drive-in movie theater tour. Mm-hmm. I created a drive-in movie theater tour when no one was working, and the very first one, we all, n- no one had left our houses. We all went to my house. We got my tour bus. We had just wrapped the day the tour bus showed up. We just wrapped the cabin, just wrapped mm-hmm. doing the cabin uh, on Netflix, and we got COVID tested. 
We got in the tour bus and we said, let's create our bubble and stay safe. And that night we drove, I think, just outside uh, Gallup. Mm-hmm. And we stayed in a, and no one had been outside. And we stayed at a, at a, at a, 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 a KOA, Camp on Arrival, and we watched thunderstorms come in on a lake. And we were all smoking cigars and drinking IPAs. And, and it was fucking mad. And that whole road trip, we road tripped across the country to start the tours. Mm-hmm. And then we just, and we were outside for the first time. And we were, and it was that period of my life. I'm so grateful. I didn't make a ton of money because we had a big crew and I made sure, I was trying to make sure everyone, because no one had paid bills in a while. But that fucking tour was the funnest. We took up pickleball. We took up disc golf. And everything was wide open in the middle of the country. You could do things, but we were still in our bubble. And we lived in that tour bus. And at the at night, we'd just get back in the tour bus by ourselves and get fucking wasted. And, and I mean, that fucking run, it'll nothing will ever be like. Yeah. And it, and, and there was this, you always had an anxiety attack halfway through that you got COVID. And this one, you know, COVID was killing people yeah. and you were like, I, I know I've got COVID. And then, and then we'd come in to Sedona. And you know, this is also why I didn't make a ton of money. We'd come into Sedona and we'd get a house in Sedona for five days at Airbnb. And we'd all isolate there before we went home to our families. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember the first time we did it, we didn't isolate. We just pulled back into LA and all our families were freaked out. So I had to stay, live on the tour bus in, at a different house and it was 4th of July and I came in and they were doing an egg toss and they're like, well, you can do an egg toss. And this is how bad my anxiety gets. You can do an egg toss with your daughter, Isla. So Isla and I did an egg toss and we fucking got it to like legit, like 40 fucking feet where I was throwing overhand, lobbing them to her Mm -hmm. and the egg cracked in her hands and it broke over her face. And I got in bed that night, high on weed fucking drunk and i went what if i gave my daughter covid from an egg toss i go that would be the most horrific way to kill a child mm-hmm. you know, she got it from an egg toss it broke in her face her dad did covid yeah but leanne gave everyone in our family covid <laughs> she came up to me and she gave me a hug yeah after christmas and Gives me a hug. I said, what's the matter? And she goes, I think I have COVID. I go, bitch, six feet. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Back it up, Fauci. Like, <laughs> fucking, and then she, we went, and then we went, oh, and then, and then she had it, and it went away, and we were all fine, and we're like, okay. And we're like, we can still go to Park City. So we all go to Park City, then Georgia gets COVID, and then Georgia starts crying, and she goes, I think I gave you COVID, and I was like, I'm fine. She goes, you're at high risk, and I'm like, what? She's like, you're a fat alcoholic. I'm like, whoa, easy. Where the fuck, is, what about feelings? <laughs> Yeah. And then Georgia got COVID. Me and Isla were still in Park City. Leanne had had it. My tour bus came up, picked Georgia up. Georgia and Leanne took him back to LA. And I was, Isla and I were there. And I tested. And then we get on the plane. And I, I cough. And Isla's got her mask on. And Isla just looks at me. You know, the best. Yeah. The one thing we miss are the eyes over masks. Yeah. The, uh, the, yeah. And then we get home and I had COVID. And Isla's like, if you gave me fucking COVID. And then she never got COVID. She never got COVID. I like Pilsners. I'm a Pilsner guy. I'm an ice cold beer guy. Ice I, cold I, Pilsner. I like an ice cold beer. I like an ice cold. One of the best beer buzzes I ever had is uh, we had bought a new house, but we weren't building it. And I, and over COVID, I didn't drink for like three months, four months until we decided to go back out on tour. And we figured that out. And I was in the backyard. And Leanne came back with like two tall boy german pilsners mm. and cracked them she goes let's have a beer and i was like fuck yeah and man that second that a beer buzz is different than anything yeah the second it it touches you you feel the sparkle and you're just like yeah baby i'm back and then she's like you want another one i'm like fuck yeah and then we have another one and then and that beer buzz is especially an afternoon beer buzz mm-hmm. is just so pretty it's different than a night beer buzz. A night beer buzz is like, oh, I guess we'll have a beer and then I'll yeah. have a couple. I got to go to work tomorrow. All right. Yeah. But that afternoon, irresponsible beer buzz. Yeah. Pilsner. Pilsner, there's, I, I don't mind an IPA, but I, it's got to be at a, it's got to, I got to be at somewhere. I got to be at somewhere. I, they got to have an IPA. Like, I like a local IPA. Mm-hmm. It's got to be food involved. And then I'm enjoying an IPA. 
uh, I, I threw up an IPA in a bathtub in uh, Salt Lake City one time. It was what, bad. What, do you, what do you mean? Oh, you threw up in the bathtub. Okay. No, no, no. I was drinking in the bathtub. Like bathtub with some water in it? Or? No, 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 no. You're sitting in the bathtub? No, I'm, I'm getting ready to take a shower. And right. I got a growler of IPA. Yep. It's about six in the morning. Yep. I have to fly that day to Vegas to jump off the stratosphere. Yeah. All I need is a little bit of a buzz to get myself on this fucking plane. Yeah. I have anxiety going through my fucking head because I'm jump. I'm going to be the first person to jump off stratosphere. And so I'm drinking an IPA out of a growler in a bathtub at six in the morning. And it just didn't sit right. And I threw it up. And I was off IPAs for like 10 fucking years. Yeah. I didn't have another IPA until I was like 46. Because I was like, all I could think about was throwing up that IPA in a bathtub in a shower and being like, oh, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up thinking about it. But yeah, I don't, I didn't fuck with IPAs for a while. And then during the pandemic, I got it. I got back into IPAs. I can't yes. touch, I can't touch, uh, uh, what's Janice Joplin's drink? Southern Comfort. I can't touch Southern Comfort. She's just drinking straight. Uh, well, I, it but was, Southern Comfort is at 40%. That's hard. No, right? it's, it's almost like a liqueur. It, yeah. Honestly, it's really sweet. Yeah. Jack, I, Jack, double Jack on the rocks, lots of rocks. Yeah. I mean, I had a quote that I got a, a, vi- a video that went viral about I'll never quit drinking. Yeah. And, uh, I have not gotten on a plane since that without having a flight attendant not even ask what I want. Walk up with a double jack on the rocks, lots of rocks. I mean, it happens so on times I don't want to drink. Yeah. I flew to Austin the other day. I was like, I'm not drinking on the plane. What could I felt sick? Yeah. And man, he walked up and he goes, double jack on the rocks, lots of rocks. I was like, fuck, you know it. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's my drink. Uh, uh, wait, what's your drink? I thought you'd be a vodka guy. See that? See, you're describing something I'll never get because I'm not regimented. It, I would love, I would love, I would love I, only for the moment that you get to have. You get the most precious little angel's breath that anyone's going to get because you live this life that's dialed in and it's scheduled. And so when you say fuck it, it's like, that's like me doing coke. Like, it's like, oh, fuck it. Yeah. Like, and you can just yeah. do that with beer. That is fucking amazing i would love to live a regimented life just to get the chance to go hey guys i'm not performing surgery today fuck it <laughs> hey guys yeah this this bus full of kids kids gotta it's gotta drive itself home fuck it well, i that- couldn't even i couldn't even tell you you know what's so interesting about me and you is like yeah you know i'm a fan of yours i couldn't even i don't really know what ai is like other than like dildos or AI, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like if it has some electronics in it. Yeah, if it has uh, electronics, it's, it's. No, I don't think like, a dildo classifies as a robot. Because I thought what, that's how they were going to take over fucking mankind. Just. <laughs> well, they start with these the, the fucking womanizer that knows how to eat a pussy, and then they're like, yeah. we don't need men anymore. But like, it's <laughs> yeah. so interesting that I couldn't even. Like, I can barely tell you what my dad does for a living. He's a lawyer. I could kind of. Like, he's called me and said, hey, man, you got to stop talking about what I do because you're not doing it right. Mm hmm. I go, what do you mean? He's like, that's not whatever you're saying I do, I don't do. And so, but like I couldn't even begin to explain your job to my daughter. How do you get them? How do you get them? I don't have anyone in my life that does that. Everybody's always worried about me. Yeah. Everyone's worried about me. <laughs> Everyone's always worried about me. The only thing yeah. no one ever says, if I showed you my DMs right now, yeah. my my texts. All it is is like, hey, man, I'm worried about you. Yeah. Like, Joe, ha- I-, I love Joe to death. Not once has he, he always, I don't know if you've seen the caring Joe eyes where, like, yeah. I'm worried about you. Yeah. Where it's like, <laughs> and you're like, yeah. hey, man, don't do that. And he's yeah. like, I'm worried about you. <laughs> and you're like, don't fucking worry about me. I'm working. Yeah. It's I'm just working. I love working. I yeah. love what I do. I love what I do. I-, I can only imagine that you love what you do as much as I love what I do. Because that's all I ever want to think about. It's all I ever want to talk about. It's all I ever want to be like. I, 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 when, when my wife wants me to take uh, August and whatever the August, whatever the fucking other <laughs> month is. September? That's comes I'm, after no, I'm, August. I'm, no, but like July and August off yeah. after we do fully loaded. And I was like, no. I was like, what do you mean? Like, so like, well, I'll just, what, am I like sit in a chair and stuff? Mm-hmm. She's like, no, you can do, like, take up a hobby. I go, writing jokes. <laughs> 
can I get on stage? Can I do st- sets in the city? Because I'm not going to fucking, you, do you want me to like, like, I don't understand what, I don't understand people who don't, I don't understand people who don't have the drive to work all the time. I don't understand that. I envy it. I envy it because I go, I would love mm-hmm. to just be like, I'm going to play video games. I can't play a video game. If I did, I'd be on Twitch trying to make money. Like, I love, how do you find someone who goes, you need to work harder? My working too hard is like on a plane every other day or every day, getting up at six, working out, and then going until like two in the morning or one in the morning, and then going to sleep and then getting up at six, working out, getting on a plane, going to another place. Like that's what my working is just a lot of travel in mine. Mm-hmm. If I didn't drink on planes, I don't think anyone would probably worry about me at all. They'd be like, no, you're doing great. It's funny because I think sometimes what people don't get about running is they go, they get on and they put it on like a six right away Mm -hmm. on like a treadmill Mm -hmm. and they go, I can't do this for fucking 30 minutes. But you can if you build yourself up to your six and you play games. I play games with myself a lot. Like I'll play games where I go, um, and I I can do this. I can do this. I, I can do this almost not all day long, but I can do this a lot longer. Like I did it for two hours the other day. Mm before my workout or no hour and a half before my workout where I started at 3.5 walking and then I and then I get my jog up to like a five and then I'm like 5.5 and then I go six and then I go and once I'm at a six my body's really loose Mm -hmm. and so then I'll go all right bring it down to a 3.5 and then I go punch it to a 7.5 for a quarter of a mile and then let's walk at a four let's jog at a five right I can do that I love they're called uh fartlets I think and I love those, like where it's like, it's regimented running and sprinting at certain levels. I love that. And I love also when I work out to listen to music, but put on foreign language cooking shows on Netflix. Can you explain that? They just put it on mute. You don't need to hear it. For some reason, they're sexier. The way they're shot, they're sexier. Yeah. And it's like street food Asia. And they're just watching them make street food in Asia. There's one called broth. It's called broth. The nation of broth. And they're just making broths. And you're like, fuck, I want some broth. So this is South America, this is Asia. This South is- America, Asia. Um, they do one on pizzas. I've watched this one on pizzas that I've watched it. There's like four episodes. I've watched every episode so many times that my trainer goes, God, that's that fucking I would I could watch that again. Yeah. Um, I love watching foreign language cooking shows on mute when I work out. I, I don't mind hiking and i like i do like you know what my fun thing the fun thing i would do and this is a this is ripped off totally from cam haynes is i like to go uh there's a great hike called fryman canyon out in the valley where i live and i'd be like all right i'm gonna run to Fram- fryman canyon i'm gonna jog to fryman canyon i'm gonna hike fryman canyon and then i'm gonna jog back mm-hmm. and then i go, wonder how long that is and i go don't think about it just know that that's your thing just know that that's your thing and then all of a sudden you're like, shit, that was eight miles. You're like, that's a fucking beast. The hike doesn't even feel like anything. The hike, once you do the jog, is the hard part there. Mm-hmm. The jog home is a fucking cakewalk. I had the best jog when I was in Serbia. I had the best jog. I think it was in Hyde Park. I think the name of the park's Hyde Park. Mm-hmm. It was, get this, it was 80% downhill. Wow. So this jog, you start at the park and it was like, and I'll do it like this for you. You went like, downhill like this downhill like this downhill like this and then it was like a little steep incline to get to the beginning of it so you, it was like a little like nice like lower back pain and you're like okay okay and then the jog was perfect mm-hmm. and you did it four times it was four miles i loved it my very first day i did it a butterfly got in front of me it's like six in the morning yeah six in the morning and a butterfly got in front of me and it ran the whole first mile in front of me. And I just, it was like so surreal. Yeah. It would disappear and then it would show back up in front of me. Yeah. You sure it was real? Yeah, definitely real. And then the next day, and so I go, I'm on the right path. I'm on the right path. The next day I go for a jog, six in the morning, and it rained. And as I'm doing the steep uh, uphill incline, a tree collapsed in front of me. Just went, wow. and I went, whoa, a tree fell in the woods and I was here to see it. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I was like, that's crazy. And it yeah. didn't hit me. I go, I'm on the right path. And then I started getting overthinking it. Like the next day I saw a condom and I was like, this is a good place to enjoy. <laughs> yeah. I was like, people fucked here last night. But yeah. 
but yeah, that was one of the best jogs I've ever had. I could do that. I could run that park every single day. And no one jogged that park in Serbia. Yeah. I think... I think I arrived at it in college. I wasn't always the guy I am. I was really a serious, pretty serious dude. Like when I got to college, like dark brooding serious. Yeah, I wanted to be like I wanted to be like Eddie Vedder. I wanted to be like a, a poet and a fucking lead singer, and I wanted to be taken seriously, and I wanted to be attractive, and I wanted to be, yeah. you know, like I wanted to be wanted by chicks and and respected by dudes, and you know, and slowly but surely. I think the bird I really am chipped away at that and was like, hey, man. Like, I, I would say funny I would say funny things that would surprise me they were so funny. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, like, in my fraternity, I'd say things that were the funniest thing that I, I go, how did I think of that? Yes. And then slowly I was like, and I remember as I, as I chipped away at that and as I got older, I would... I would I would lean towards that. We would go on a bus trip to like Clemson, and I would get on the 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 walkie-talkie on the bus, and I would do stand up for like an hour. I just make jokes hmm. for an hour, and I and I loved the impulse of like you know you get on the bus and everyone's like we're gonna drink, and you get that one group of girls that wasn't gonna drink, and then to break them, and they're like oh fuck it, fine, let's drink, and then that to to watch that happen, and I think. Then once I, and then when I went to Russia, this is so cliche for me to say, but interacting with those young banditi, mm -hmm. they were pr they were pretty serious dudes. They didn't have like they were pretty stoic dudes, mm -hmm. and when you could make them laugh, it was like a real it was a real joy. The silliest things I remember, you know, we were told there was a club. It's called it was, it was called Cafe Europa or maybe Cafe Americana. Mm -hmm. There's where everyone really hung out, like all the the real dudes, the real dudes in St. Petersburg. And they had told us that, like, they had told us in our class that uh, Russian women didn't have tampons. Mm -hmm. So they were like, bring tampons to give to the babushka, the, the dabuchka that ran the floor. After all this time, the fact that your Russian sucks is awesome. Yeah. Because you keep mispronouncing words horribly. I, I, horribly. <laughs> I'm so fucking bad. Yeah. I am so bad. You know, that's you, how, you know that's how I got the name of the machine, right? Yeah. I was trying to say I'm machine, a man. Machina, yeah. And I said I'm a car. <laughs> yeah. And they just were like, huh? <laughs> and so I came into the room one night with a top pocket full of tampons. Yeah. And they were like, what are those for? I said, girls, how are we going to pick up girls? And the look on their face was so, it was so pure joy. I remember the first night I pulled out lemons. And this is, it sounds, it sounds make-believe now to say it because it's been in the movie. And yeah. but I brought out lemons, we were in lemon drops. I had vodka and lemons and sugar and a pocket knife and a fanny pack. And I pulled out lemons and, and this guy Igor goes, oh, the machine runs on lemons? Like it was just so foreign that you would need lemon for them. Yeah. And so I, I think... And I made friends with those guys, like I mean, like friends, whatever you can. But like, definitely me and that guy Igor were legit friends, legit friends. Like, but from a place of joy, like bringing yeah, joy like to it was like life. it was like real seeing them light up. And then I remember backpacking through Europe after that, and realizing I could bring a spark of fun to like a campfire. And I had little tricks, like I learned all the currencies around the world, and so I'd I'd challenge people to a currency game. I go, let's go. Head to head, you say you you name a country in the currency, and I'll name a country in the currency. Yeah. And I would I would slow roll them. I just do the, all the dollars, right? The Chinese dollar, the American dollar, the Australian dollar. I'd run through all the dollars, and they'd be like, "You only know the dollars." And then I and then I get start getting really deep. Mm -hmm. I could make an event out of a night in in Europe. I could make an event. I remember we were in uh, Strasbourg, and the bar was supposed to close, but I had friends coming to the bar. They had, the train hadn't gotten. Uh, in in yet and i said i said don't close the bar i'll stand on the bar and i'll entertain everyone in this room i'll dance i'll do whatever if you just keep the bar open mm -hmm. and the guy goes if you can keep me laughing i'll keep the bar open and i danced and and made this guy laugh on a bar for legit mm -hmm. i'm not even like i'll legit 30 minutes until my friends walked in and they're like what the fuck's going on i had this ability to, to, to without humility, I didn't mind looking like a fool. 
and like doing and they were really stupid jokes at the time just very like base american frat boy jokes but i had a spark and when i came back i feel i feel like i I learned how to like to do that and do funny things that were like fun like i would we go to a football game and i'd i'd i brought a camera around with me a lot i like to take pictures and i remember one of the jokes i'd go is i go hey everybody I told my parents I have a lot of friends. Can you guys gather around and we'll take a picture? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like 50 people would lean around like, hey! <laughs> and like just the dumbest, yeah. silliest things. And 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 I don't and I wasn't a big self-promoter. So these would happen and I would just I was just doing them for me and my friends. Mm-hmm. I'd bring a guitar out and I just make up songs. And and uh and and so I think in in watching this this serious bird get chipped away at until my like sixth and a half year of college where it was just this silly guy mm-hmm. and then Rolling Stones written about me and I'm like and then I'm like well f-, and I remember a couple serious dads going yo you got a chance to turn this into something you need to go to New- you need to follow your dream and I tried stand up the first night and I was like I maybe not wasn't the funniest guy but man they laughed and we had a good time for thirty minutes and it worked and it was stream of consciousness. And I was like, yeah. And then, of course, you know that same little path you take gets convoluted in in, in New York because you want to be a serious comic and you want to be taken seriously and you want to be edgy and you want to say the. And then slowly but surely, that you the real Bert chips away at it, and he's like, yo, man, just fucking take your shirt off, kill a beer, yeah. Like fucking tell the machine story, tell a story about your stupid kids. Yeah. Like just you don't need to be the fucking edgiest dude in the room. Leave that to the good ones. Let let, let Bill and fucking Joe and Tom. They're the those are the legit fucking gangster comics. There, I mean, those are the fucking. I'm. You're never gonna out fucking Chappelle. Those those guys are fucking gangsters. Do what you do. Have fun. Make life fun and seize the day and fucking try to bring a spark to people and let them forget about their fucking day. Yeah, and when someone goes, "All right, I'm in," like yeah, that. All right, yeah, that's yeah. the funnest. And then, yeah. especially when you have a big group, yeah. and there's like a big group, and yeah. like we were at the premiere the other night, and and uh, and I was working, I was legit working. I do, I'm trying to sell the movie to uh, outlets, mm-hmm. media outlets, and uh, busting with the boy, busting with the boys. My wife flew them in to surprise me, and they're over on the red carpet, and they're like, "Yo, let's let's scull a beer, let's kill a beer," and I was like, "Oh," and then I'm like, "Oh, fuck it, I don't give a. F- this is what life's about." And that moment where they're like, yeah, that's the funnest fucking, especially when I can get Leanne to do it. When I get Leanne to get a drink and she'll, and she's like, like I wasn't supposed to drink last night. And she was like, you want to just, we should go get, have a glass of wine in the front yard. And you're like, oh, oh, my heart skips a beat. I go, glass of wine in the front yard. Are we going to talk wild? Are we going to say crazy shit to each yeah. other? Like, fuck yeah. In the front yard. Front yard, yeah. What are you doing in the front yard? Let the dogs play. Oh. Big trees in the front yard. Why are so you sitting on the? Where were you sit, sitting? Sitting in the in the Adirondacks on the front porch, letting the dogs play, letting the dogs rest in the front yard. Maybe go over, pick some cherries, look at the fucking trees, hear the wind going through the front yard, and then you go to the backyard. That's where the cigar comes out. A little yeah. more privacy, but yeah. Red light. You don't need to. You don't need to. Let's just start smoking too. Yeah. Just have a fucking cigarette. Yeah. I was gonna start writing poetry. Dude, Hemingway. There's uh like a glass of wine in Italy and like uh like just out in like we went we went oh the most beautiful fucking day of my life. Just outside Florence, it, they have all the vineyards and stuff and we took a Vespa tour. Nice. And uh and it was fucking and Isla's too young to ride, so she's on the back. And now everyone can drink there. You know, you're not supposed to drink and drive Vespas, but they don't, they go, a glass of wine is nothing. Yeah. And you're like, okay, <laughs> I guess I'll have a couple then. If yeah, you yeah. think one's nothing, then I think two's nothing yeah. also. So this is drunk Bert on a Vespa? Drunk, not even drunk, but just lightly, yeah. lightly feathered Yeah, where, and it's beautiful. My wife hasn't been drinking. Georgia has, Georgia's too young. Isla is too young. But I had, at dinner we had a couple and we're going through these hills and it starts raining and it starts raining. And I go, Isla, what are we missing? And she goes, music, big boy. And I go, what do you want to hear? And then she just starts going, ooka, shaka, ooka, 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 shaka, ooka, ooka. I can't stop this feeling. She's screaming it behind. And then I hear Georgia screaming it. And then Leanne singing it. And then Sandy and her two daughters are singing it. 
we're all in these Vespas and we're all singing it. And and I and I swear to God, if I hadn't been lightly feathered, I don't know if I would have been like, Ida, what are we missing? Because yeah. you know, alcohol will give you that thing like, mm-hmm. what's next? Yeah. What's bigger? How do we take this to the next level? And then I got this little girl who's my, still my little girl at that moment when she's singing, sing it. All the good times. <laughs> Give it up so long. Yeah. Give it up, girl. And then we stop at the and we stop at the light, and all of us are looking, and it's pouring rain. Ah, yeah. ooh, ooh. Do, do the feeling don't. It is. I mean, I remember uh, <laughs> sobbing, crying, sobbing, crying, sobbing, crying, yeah. and then I was like, "Let's get these fucking vespas up and get to a vineyard." Yeah. And then we went to a vineyard, and the, all the girls tried a little wine. No one got buzzed or anything, but you're just sitting there with your family, going like. Fuck, dude. It and I'm not certain you get that without a little bit of There's a, a gift someone gives you when they get drunk and they allow you they get drunk and they lower their guard mm-hmm. and they allow you to see them that way. It's a gift. It's a real gift. It's just as cool as like pulling someone aside and going, yo, I'm into anime. Mm-hmm. Like, are you cool with that? And then they're going, Yeah, I'm oh uh, yeah. Can I show you some cool anime? And then you're like, that's not my thing, but it's like a cool thing. It's like sharing cool music with someone or, or like telling them something about your childhood. When you when you get drunk, like real drunk around someone, you're giving them a gift. Yeah. And that gift is, I want you to see me for everything I am. Yeah. You're not going to get any lies. You're not going to get any bullshit. This is me at my absolute worst. I have a rule. I will never, never get mad at someone for getting too fucked up because they're giving you a gift. They're saying like, Yo, I did this on accident, but I trust you enough to let you know that this is who I am and this is what you're getting. I love it. I love it. Especially when it comes from someone you don't expect. Like you? Mm-hmm. Shut the fuck up. David Goggins should have hugged you and said, thanks for showing me this. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's cool when people let you see that in them. Because some people are really like measured. Like, no, one drink, and then I'm done. I don't want it. No, 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 no. And you're like, oh, show me a little more. Mm-hmm. And then, like, it's cool. And I never, like, I, and I love I, my favorite moments in the next morning when they're like, did I make an ass out of myself? And you get to say, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. That's the coolest thing. Because some people, bad people, will leverage that over yeah. you. you can, and you can see it's a bully tactic. They'll leverage that. The bad interactions I've had mm-hmm. with in this business that we were talking about earlier, they were people that, that, when you got fucked up, they used it against you. Yeah. They held it over your head and they said, listen, man, I don't know what the fuck, but if you want, and you're like, hold on. Mm-hmm. And then and then they made you, they gaslight you into thinking you were the only one that was fucked up. And you're like, okay, I guess I know who you are now. And yeah. I was like, didn't you get fucked up a little bit too? Yeah. Like, I know we smoked weed and I thought we ate Xanax, but like, what about the, I know I had a, a couple beers, but like, I wasn't that fucked up. It was funny. I got blackout drunk at Whitney's roast of me, like blackout yeah. drunk. Don't remember any of it, and don't remember any of it. Don't remember speaking on the microphone. I don't remember talking in the microphone. <laughs> and and I, I I did the set apparently. Yeah. And I said to Whitney, like in a real moment of vulnerability, Whitney's like a sister to me, like a legit sister. My daughters call her Aunt Whitney. Leanne, she's like a sister to Leanne. If she comes over to do a podcast, Whitney will show up an hour early and sit with Leanne out in Leanne's rose garden and just talk. Mm-hmm. And Whitney, I, I said the next day I called Whitney and I was getting on a plane and I was knew I was hungover. I said, "How bad was I last night?" She goes, "You were fucking fantastic," and just didn't let me sit with it. And then I watched yeah. the video and I was like, "Oh, I was fucking out of control. <laughs> yeah. I was way out of control. Thank you yeah. for li- lying to me." Yeah. So <sighs> while being a wild out there comic, she's also this like caring and loving human being she's so interesting fucking, she is she has the most nurturing sensibility she is you she sends my daughter's gifts out of nowhere just out of nowhere just send georgia gifts up at college mm-hmm. it's just a gift box like she is just she takes care of people you and whitney i would love to sit in a fucking room and watch you two talk yeah she has a robot that yeah. looks like her and um, that's the future, that robot. I told her she should have that robot do porn. Let someone fuck that robot. Mm-hmm. And then and she can, she can deep fake the face if she wants. But I go, promote, it, promote a special that way. <laughs> <laughs> I 
like a full on, not like Showtime softcore porn, like full on porn, porn. Full on, like the dude, like, he's like, hi, welcome inside. Yeah. You look tired. Do you need a drink? Yeah. Oops, I'm stuck in the dryer. You know. What's the promotion you're most proud of that you've done? Without a doubt, it's got to be when I took dance lessons. Yeah, that was epic. Because I had tried to get Joe and Tom and Ari to do it for Sober October. I was rooting for you. And they said no. Joe's like, absolutely not. You knew Joe was going to say no. But but Joe's a legit dancer. Like, he can legit dance. He took, like, dance lessons for a movie and is apparently an amazing dancer. Mm -hmm. And so... You're right. He could have said yes. He could have said yes. Because I remember listening to that podcast where you really made the pitch. Yeah, and I said, we all take hip-hop dance lessons. Yeah. It's your, your cardio is through the roof. Yeah. And, and those you do an, an hour dance lesson, and then we all do a hip-hop dance, and then we all put our hip-hop dances against each other, and we see who has the best hip-hop dance. Yep. It's different than the typical stuff we do. It's fun. And we can also work out. We can do everything, but like, let's do hip-hop dance. And Joe Adam Lee was like, that's a horrible idea. I will not do that. And then, and then Tom and Ari just, you know, just whatever. They were like, yeah, I, I side with Joe. We'll do something else. And then I was like, I, but I knew I liked hip-hop dance. And so I was like, I'm going to take hip-hop dance lessons anyway. I'm going to just do it over Sober October. And I'm just going to, I'm going to fucking do it. And then maybe, maybe I'll do a hip-hop dance video mm-hmm. and then show it to them and let them rate me. Mm-hmm. And then we did it. And I, and it was $1,200 and I, for hip-hop dance lessons for like a month or whatever, for like a couple weeks. And then when we did it, I thought, you know what? I bet we could put tour dates next to this because mm-hmm. it's it was it, it turned out being like kind of good but kind of funny. I go, but we could put tour dates next to this, and it was the beginning of me figuring out the whole like my promos were short and quick, mm-hmm. and they were always like something silly. What's up, guys? It's your boy Burt Kreischer. And then that one blew up, and immediately I was announcing the tour, and immediately every tour date sold out. And then every we added shows that day. We added shows, and every one of those sold out. And I was like, "Whoa!" And then Tom was like, "The fuck was that?" And I was like, "I think I just sold out my whole fucking tour." And and then Tom, and then when Tom did his one like that and put his tour dates on it, yeah, went over the top. He sold out his tours, and and he was like, "Whoa!" He's like, "Dude, I sold out every fucking show. We've added shows. I'm doing like an arena here." And this is before we were doing arenas. I was like, shut the fuck up. And that changed my game where I was like, all right, so everything's got to be. And then and then I was like, I don't mind spending a little money. And then the next one I did was the marching band. And I was just like, and but it was, you know, it's real crazy. I just said, can you guys get me a marching band? And they were like, yeah, it's like, it's like 2,400 bucks. I go, cool. And they're like, what do you want them to do? And I go, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And they came over and they had outfits and they were like, so where do, where do, what do you want us to play? I go, what song do you guys know? And then they didn't even know each other. They were all hired people. And they were like, rubber band man? And I was like, oh, sure. Yeah. And then we just scripted it out. I was like, all right, I'll pretend it's a regular thing. Let's we'll wait. So I'll walk out and then I'll blow a whistle. Mm-hmm. And then you come out with the dum 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 And then, and then we, we got like two videos out of that. And that sold out dates. And then I was like, fuck. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then the real baller one. The fucking real one, the real one was I tore all the muscles in my arm going into and do, shooting the movie and I ripped all the tricep muscles off and they were retracted. So I had to go in for surgery. And the anesthesiologist said to me the night before, he's like, what music do you want going in, going under? And I was like, what? And he goes, you can pick your music going under. I said, wait, hold on. What is it like? He go, I go, is it like casual? And he was like, yeah. I said, I'm doing a promo read going under. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I'll, I'll explain it to you tomorrow, but I'm gonna, I'm not going to count backwards. I'm just going to do a promo read until I pass out. Mm-hmm. And my phone's going to fall on the ground. All I need you to do is hit stop record. Mm-hmm. And so they rolled me into surgery. I had Red Rocks. I had only sold like 75% of Red Rocks, which is the biggest, 10,000. It was the biggest venue I'd, I'd ever played in. And I rolled in with my thing, with CCR playing in the background, and I just was like, as I lay here on this mat or on this steel pile, I was yeah. terrified as I go into surgery, I want you to know one thing. I'm playing Red Rock September 10th. Yeah. And then I started doing my promo read. And he was like, yeah. I go, Jimmy Buffett's there the night before yeah. and the night after. He's like, for real? I go, yeah. You want to come? He's like, hell yeah. He's like, all right. Yeah. He's like, you're going under. And he hits it. I go, sure. And I dropped the phone. I woke up out of surgery. And the first thing I said is, where's my phone? And he goes, you got it. 
and Leanne's like, I've already watched it. It's good. And I went for real. Nice. And so like, that was a, that was a, that was a, that was a big one. That was a big one too. It's, there's something really fun, authentically fun about just coming up with a really stupid idea mm-hmm. and just going, let's see what happens. Who gives a fuck? Mm-hmm. We've had those, like, I thought I could catch an arrow one time. And, <laughs> yeah. and, my, and my wife's like, absolutely fucking not. And I go, I really think I can. I go, let's just get really close, shoot it, and then I'll see if I can catch it. And she's like, no, that's not what you're doing. And then my cousin's like, hey, we could cheat it to make you look like you caught an arrow. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, just, okay, let's do it like this. And so we did it. And it got sold a ton of tickets. It mm-hmm. looked like I really caught it. Everyone knows I didn't catch an arrow. I mean, for the movie, we did a promo. Legendary was like, you do all the promos. And we did a promo, and I thought I could slide out of my car like Tom Cruise did in a in a helicopter yeah. and with roller skates and get behind the car and then skate behind the car. Mm-hmm. And we just ran over my foot. And it was real, and it was scary, but we just ca- caught it all. And in doing it, my cousin's like, give me the read. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, duh, my movie comes out Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I think we have to go to the hospital. And then we went to the hospital, and I'm in a Speedo with a helmet on, yeah. one broken roller skate. <laughs> and then and then that did really well. And so, like, I said, the whole thing is just turn the camera on. You never know yeah. what's going to fucking happen. And don't be afraid to look stupid and all that kind of stuff. Just go all out. Fucking ego is the death of comedy. Like, when you, when you really give a – like, if – it's hard to be the coolest guy in the room and still want to be a comedian. It's just let yourself be whoever you are. And you'll see the great ones. They're like that. They don't, the, you know, they're, they're, they're just regular fucking dudes. And you get some real slick ones. Like Dave, Dave Chappelle might be the coolest guy in the fucking room. He might, might really might be, yeah. but I think that's just who the fuck he is. Oh yeah. No. <laughs> I just, like, I wanted to say that it's an interesting pairing. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mitch Hedberg, David Tell, David uh, Tell, David Tell. Every everybody deeply respects David Tell more than even his comedy. I love the show where he was uh, Insomniac. Insomniac. He's so good at just the the natural comedy of human interaction. He's a brilliant comic. He's just a brilliant fucking mind. Um, Norm Macdonald's a fucking genius, an absolute genius. I mean, look. You know, Chappelle and Bill Burr are are the two best in our generation, in my opinion. And and that's you know, and that's understanding that like I'm still friends with some of the best in our generation, but like just the way their brains work is really on a next level. Mm-hmm. Like you know, those are guys. Stan Hope is the same way, just fucking genius. You know, I, Rogan, Segura, those are my friend group. That's my really close friend group. But like those other guys, I'm, I'm friends with, but they're not like that's like, yeah. Louis C.K. Oh, Louis C.K., fuck. He's amazing. The it's dark. hard to do because you start, like, forgetting the, like, people, and then it's almost like people go, oh, so you didn't like that person? You're like, no, I fucking yeah. love that person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, for, for me, like, Robin Williams, which is a whole nother thing. Oh, yeah. Just Sarah like- Silverman, uh, fucking, uh, I love Janine. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fucking big Janine fan. I love her brain. Marin's fucking hilarious. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, Patton's brilliant. David Cross. I mean, there's like, it's, you know, it's, it's really to ignore those guys. And those guys were like the whole forefront of the alternative comedy front. Mm -hmm. They're fucking amazing. Coolest thing. When I first started to watch someone like Attell was really brilliant at it because you'd watch him tinker with a set. Yeah. And he'd he'd have an idea like hitting someone over the head with a hammer from behind. Mm -hmm. And then he'd work it nine different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, and you'd be like, whoa. So he, you're, the hitting hammer in the head is the thing that he's working on. I hope it, uh, Eddie Murphy comes back. He's one of the greats. Chris Rock. Chris, Chris Rock's Rock. fucking yeah. bring the pain is like the reason I got into comedy. Yeah. Don't worry too much about what you do when you get older. But when you do start worrying... Find the thing you love, and it'll never feel like work. The To fucking, I can't imagine what it must feel like to be a lawyer and have to read papers or whatever they do all day and know that that's my day. Yeah. I mean, that, I, it must feel like what, I, what school felt like for me. Mm-hmm. If you find that thing you love to do, you will work endlessly, effortlessly, 
and hard as fucking shit every day, and you'll love every day of your life. Find what you love and let it kill you. Bukowski said that. For then that's the fucking thing, because that's what I'm doing. I'm yeah. letting it fucking take. I'm I'm fucking. I'm I'm on that fucking bullet train to fucking nowhere on this fucking comedy journey. I love it. I love it. I love I love those guys that can really live that life that are like, yeah, man, I'm breaking it. I'm breaking it down like a guy like Tony Hawk or Matt Hoffman yeah. who's like, yeah, if I if I don't fucking break the fuck out of this thing before I, I'm, yeah. then I'm not doing it right. Then again, there's also Churchill who tried to break the thing and he couldn't. Lived into his 90s. A bad motherfucker. Just a bad motherfucker. So I guess the only hope we can have for Burke Kreischer is that you're going to be the Winston Churchill of comedy. My life is lived perfectly <laughs> if I'm 95 years old and all my friends are dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, they're like, can you believe that wolf yeah. got Rogan? Yeah. Can you believe that Segura, wolf. 600 pounds and they had to, Carry him out in a crane out of that house. Can you believe that it's just Burt Kreischer and Joey Diaz left? <laughs> <laughs> just standing there in October, silver yeah. October, just the two of you left. It's, it's, just silver laughing. Silver October is just, I'm 95 at the Mark Twain Awards, and they're like, <laughs> Burt Kreischer still fucking here. Who saw that coming? You, man i am a huge fan of yours you keep doing you i'll keep doing me and then let's see if we can meet in the middle sometime yeah. have a cold beer in the afternoon this is the lex free podcast